Hey, welcome back for session 10 of CEE 120D 220D. Uh, today we are going to cover really a continuation of structural uh, modeling and start moving towards analysis. We're going to continue to think about the structures of your uh, models and how you can start to uh, go through and add structural elements and do that effectively and efficiently, but then move on to starting to think about how we can analyze those structures, applying loads and trying to use some analysis tools to actually come back and size up what I think some of those elements should be. So that's going to be kind of the bulk of what we're doing today. Along the way, we're going to talk though about model integration and kind of look at what's happening in the A360 site and the BIM360 site and how all these different layers and pieces work together. There's a lot of tools that are all out there to help us just coordinate and collaborate and share models with each other. It's a little confusing how they all work together and why you use one in some cases and others in other cases. They all have kind of different use scenarios and we'll see if we can help map you through that as well as just the logistics of how you get your models up there and kind of share models from there so you have some of that behind you. Okay. As we get going today though, just to get started, I'd like to go ahead and kind of look at think of the, about the integrated design project and sort of what's going on there. Basically, in the scheme of things, as we're moving on through, this is kind of oh, the time when we're starting to sort of talk about our structural framing and what that might look like, trying to capture some ideas for that and put it into the journal. So this week, generally, as you're checking with us, you should be thinking about, like, um, you know, just sort of being at that point. Everyone's, again, slightly ahead, slightly behind. Everyone's in a slightly different point in that journey. So that's OK, but we're just going to keep on giving you some approximate milestones to sort of just always be focusing on sort of about where you should be in the process. So we're kind of at that point, like, oh, if you haven't started doing anything yet, after today's session, you should definitely be thinking about where some of the grid lines are, or where some of the columns or structural walls are going to be, and just you know how the major support elements are going to like work. And everyone's structure is a little bit different, so that will vary again. And you know, the TAs are really good at helping to advise you on specific like ways you might approach them, and point out past examples of like how people have done some of these things, so that you can like uh, learn from that. There's a lot of good information out there online to go ahead and benefit from. So I highly encourage you to go ahead and look at that. Okay, in terms of check-in times list this, this week, let me just start with that. It looks like we have a fairly full house going on this afternoon, like from 4 till 6.30. And let me just check with the guys here. Like, are you, are you both going to be here, or one of you going to be here, or who's, who's going to be here through that period? Uh, could be here through like 5, 5.30. Got it. Mr. Apple, are you here something too? Or so what's your support? Three, yeah. Okay, no worries. I'll sort of be here for the duration too. So is there anyone who doesn't have a time slot yet who needs a time slot? Yeah, no worries. You still need one? 4.30, but I forgot I had a class at 4.30. Okay, so are you knocking yourself out of 4.30 then? Yeah. Okay, no worries. Um, Do that. Are there other options? Oh no, it's basically we can set up some more times in terms of sort of offering some more tomorrow. Okay. We'll do something like that. Yeah, no. I just canceled mine at 3.30. Okay. Yeah, because we sort of met informally doing it that way. So if 3.30 works, yes, then go ahead and take that. Ruby. I used to play that too, but so my ah. added uh, yesterday. Very good. Okay. Then for anyone who's sort of canceling or shifting, if you can go out there and just knock yourself out. Maybe like, uh, I think if you get to the appointment, you can say you're going to cancel it. Just to open the slot. We'll sort of shift it around. If there is an earlier slot for you, Norbert, could you do it today? Yeah, well, uh, 3.30 is good. 3.30 is good? Yeah. Okay, what's, good. What's the rest of now I don't see 3.30 as a slot there. Who, who had 3.30? Oh, I see so. But now it's open. Okay. <laughs> One way or the other, hang around at 3.30 and we'll get you covered. Because if we can get it all done today, that'd be super. Okay. Other things that are going on in terms of just thinking about the whole uh, design general experience. Let me go over to the Bimtopia side for just a second. I was uh, going through and just kind of oh, looking at things that are hanging out there in the design journal right now. This is kind of the back end of the whole system, so I can sort of see oh, what different articles have been posted and then sort of adjust them a little bit. So for a few of them, I went through and kind of pulled out an image to use as a teaser image that would then make it appear on the main page. A lot of people are doing really good in terms of getting that. If you somehow missed on a teaser image, let me just kind of show you how that works in terms of you know the basic process. It's like, uh, let me go out here. The issue is really whether or not you're showing up in that list. So 
There's a couple of things to go ahead and take a look at. You know, in terms of accessing all the different design journal entries, if you've assigned yourself a category which includes 120C in the spring, you should show up if you kind of select yourself over here. So, oops, excuse me, B. Okay, so here are some of the latest ones that are hanging around. And please go ahead and take a look at this. Get inspired by some of the things some of your colleagues are working on. And, ask questions about how they did some of that stuff. So uh, you can go at it that way. The other way to do it, just to check to see if all your stuff is uh, attributed properly is, let's go ahead and let me just look at Joe's site. So here we are. This is if we just look at it by person, we can go back and kind of see the running history of all the different design journal issues in entries for any person. So there's Bochin. Just you can go back. So if anything's missing, if you don't see your entry, chances are you've got it in there, it's just misattributed. You just need to go back and edit it. In that case, what you do is you go back and just uh, edit the entry. So for example, if you don't have, let me take a look at long season like, uh, entry for right now. Let's see, I'll fix this. Uh, come into there. Okay, so you always want to go through and have basically a name and a class. Okay, and those two things will get basically put you in good stead. Publishing is just whether or not it is appearing live on the site. The idea of the teaser image is just this field right here. And if you don't have a teaser image, what happens is you don't show up in that little grid of pictures. If you want to add a teaser image so you show up in there, what I've been doing whenever people don't include them is what I usually do is just go back to your article and say, hey, I've got some Im good images here. I just go out and grab one of those images. Just copy that little blob of text right here from her screenshot. And I just paste it in right here. So that's how you add a teaser image if you don't have one. It's really just a priority image that's used in the list. It's always like a little thumbnail that sits over on the left-hand side to kind of give you an idea of what the article is about. But it also is used as the way to uh, kind of put you in the grid. So if any of your articles aren't showing up in the grid and you want to get them up on the front page, all you need to do is add a teaser image. And then it will show up here. And it's kind of nice to have things out here because as you go ahead and kind of take a look at these different ones, you sort of get a sense of what different people are up to. Click on any of those and you can get to the article. So it's just kind of a really nice snapshot. We're going to talk today about A360 models and how you make that happen. An A360 model, if you've included a link, let's see if there is a link in here. There it is. There's a link to the model. will allow someone to open, by just clicking on that link, a version of your model that's out there hanging out on the web. So here we are. We can go ahead and orbit around. We can go walking around a little bit. This interface on the web I don't think is nearly as convenient as the interface that's on either an iPhone or an iPad. But it's still a pretty good interface for working around. And you can just basically start to see people's models, either looking at different views that have been shared. Looks like only this one, this one only has the main 3D model. Okay, but also starting to do things like just navigating around in there. You can go through and, for example, if you want to have a peek inside the model, we can look at the properties or what am I looking for? I am looking for, oh, we can explode the model or section the model. Sectioning might be fun. For example, if you want to sort of see inside how he's thinking about his structure working. There's a section plane it on back in there and looks like I'm seeing kind of a main atrium space with some elevators and some other things in there. But the idea is really just being very public with your models and sharing with them because you know the more you can sort of expose what you're up to and allow other people to benefit from that and you can see their models, it's really all we kind of help learn each or teach each other and kind of learn best lessons. You can also download the model if you want to. But for the most part we're out there just to kind of like a look at them. So 
please get on the website, go through and put those links so that other people can use those. And we'll talk about how to get your models up there again today in just a little bit. Okay. Any questions about sort of the whole design journal? I think we've been meeting with most people pretty regularly. Uh, some people are a few entries behind, and just go ahead and, as you can, go through and post things. The idea is really just, you know, don't get so far behind that it becomes a big task later. And even if, you know, it's two or three weeks in and you've missed one, don't necessarily feel like you have to go back and get them all. Just, you know, just start now and move forward. So definitely you should put something out there this week just so you have something we can share with everybody and uh, keep us all up to date. Okay, we were talking last time about structural load, structural requirements, and structural modeling. And that's where we'll start today. We want to look at the whole issue of really, if we're going to model our structures, how we go through and handle um, the different types of elements that support the different types of loads we need to worry about. And we started with the whole kind of gravity load systems. These gravity load systems are the ones that we you know, kind of think an awful lot about in terms of supporting the four loads of a roof and how to carry that down. In terms of supporting the floor planes or the roof planes, there's oh, usually this notion of uh, some sort of beams and beam systems. We'll talk some more about that. And those are usually connected to some sort of vertical supports. And here's where you can have a little bit of fun, because in terms of supporting things vertically, we often think about things in terms of being columns supporting beams and beam systems. But we can also use walls. If you're going to have a bunch of concrete walls and some sort of walls that have a bearing capacity, we can be using those to carry things out. But we can also think about, oh, cantilevering things, supporting them from the side, or hanging them if necessary. There's all sorts of strategies for supporting things. So don't necessarily think that it has to be a whole field of columns. In fact, yeah, some structures are almost all cantilevered. Ruby's working on sort of a very interesting tree-like structure where pretty much everything's going to be cantilevered from the central like that trunk, which would be kind of interesting. Um, but there's a lot of strategies for you how you can do this. We'll go through and kind of look some more at this, as well as the whole issue of kind of adding the foundation elements. This one's going to finish out the structural modeling a little bit, give you a little more experience with that. And then we can even take a look at some of the cases that you guys are having a sort of, or, you know, working with and kind of thinking about. Okay, actually, I should check in with you guys. As you've been talking to people, are people starting on the structural stuff, or where are people you know, relative to that? Or just kind of just before that? I think last I met with people, it was just before that. Just before that. I met with a couple people where we've been talking about the structure a little bit and kind of those first elements. But let's just kind of, like, again, just kind of warn you into this so that you uh, have a good sense of really what we're up to. Okay, let me come over here, finish that up. I was just updating some things in Revit. Actually, here, it's kind of a good thing to do. Well, well, we'll hit it when we do the glue thing in just a second. You know, it's, there's this whole notion in general on your machines of every once in a while running this thing called the Autodesk Application Manager. What that's all about is updating things. And here's a list of uh, some different programs, some different updates to them. I just installed this thing, Civil Structures, for Autodesk Revit. It was an update to Revit oh, a few weeks ago. But in this list, there are often updates to sort of make the software a little fresher, and more importantly, software that helps it work with some of the web services. Because here's what happens. As your uh, copy of the application on your machine kind of statically stays at the same or date, but in the back end, some of the server-based systems keep updating themselves, sometimes the links break so that things don't work together and the way Autodesk fix that is they go through an issue or release uh, hotfix to the application to go ahead and reconnect the, the way it should be doing it now. So it's important to everyone's while to go through here and just see what you're behind on and sort of refresh and update things. We'll hit that a little bit later today. We're going to try and use the BIM 360 glue extension. And if somehow uh, you know, you're a little bit out of date, the solution is usually to go to this Autodesk application manager and run that and just run through the process to kind of get it up to speed. So let's just kind of leave that alone for now. But I will go through and we're going to open. And we're going to start with, oh, if you go to session 10's materials, we'll jump into an example that, oops. 
for me it's still session nine, but I think for you guys it's session 10 if you downloaded it recently. In either case, it's the structural modeling examples. Let's go ahead and take a look in there. And within there, there's basically that building we were working on last time, just march marching through a whole series of different like steps to kind of ultimately start building it. So early on, it's this whole notion of a simple building with no grids. We added some grids. Yeah. Then we went through and we uh, kind of linked it and bring in some structural template features. But I want to go ahead and start right about at, let's go ahead and start at 3A. That'll sort of jump us into the middle a little bit, kind of from where we were last time. So we're going to continue developing the structure a little bit, add some more things to it, and uh, kind of think about some of the boundary cases where we want to do things that are a little uh, more unusual, okay, but things that are usually modeled within Revit. So this model should be fairly similar to where we left it last time. What we're looking at here is, here's sort of the basic structure. Looks like I have a section box turned on right now, but I have some columns down here on the first floor. It looks like you even have some beams up here on the first floor. It's a little steel frame structure. Yes? Oh, it's, um, if you downloaded it last time, it, it's in the, there's a folder called structural, let me find it here, framing examples. But I'm opening, it's 3A in that folder. So let me see if I can find that again for you. We'll come out here. It's called Structural Modeling Examples. I originally posted it in session 9, but it should be out there in session 10. If it's not, I might need to sort of republish it. I see it. OK. So we're hanging out here. Let me go ahead. I'm just going to turn off the section box so I can see more of the model. No worries, not doing too much more. Okay, so basically what's happening here, if I go through and look at the different floor plans, let's just take a look. Here's level one, I got level one kind of hanging around over here. You'll see I'll have some grids in there. I have level two, there's not much happening up there just yet. I'll go back to level one for right now. And what I'm going to do is zoom on in here Actually, this model is a little bit different. As I'm looking at it, I'm thinking that this is one where I actually went through and created and I have the architecture and the structure in the same model. <laughs> Which is not necessarily what I recommend doing. I tend to like to separate those two things and see different models. But for the purpose of our structural modeling, that will work okay for what we're doing right now. Okay. So in terms of looking at this, you'll notice I have these different grid lines. These grid lines are placed in such a way that if I place the columns, the steel members, they're not intersecting the walls. So there's this whole notion about where your grid lines are and really placing your structural elements on the grid lines and then letting the walls have a relationship to that. So for my structure, I'm choosing to go through and say it's going to be a steel frame that really has walls that are not structural supporting the outside. And then what we're doing is just going through and placing columns inside, the walls a little bit further on the outside. Now, in this kind of scenario, it's a very common scenario. In fact, the Y2E2 building is one of the buildings you know that's been built this way, where the structural frame is really independent of the outside walls. What tends to happen is the outside walls sit on the floor slab and clip to it, okay? but those columns are actually inside of the outer wall assembly. And what we'll usually do in cases like this where these columns are sitting inside, you just go ahead and box them in a little bit. So you know, architecturally, it will be some sort of little wall element, uh, some sort of interior wall, typically with just sheetrock on one side. Let me say, here's a little interior wall. But we'll do something like this. We'll just box out around it and hide those from you. So if you're ever sitting in one of the professor's offices and noticing that over on the wall, there's this funny little boxed out area, 
it's quite common to actually have a column running down through there. There's other things we do by boxing out these little areas. Every once in a while, we have plumbing pipes that need to come down through a room. We'll box those out and kind of hide those. We usually don't like to keep that stuff exposed. But whenever you see these little bumps in a surface, there's usually some sort of purpose to it. It has something going on inside, hiding some structure or hiding some mechanical. Okay, but in terms of just the structural framing, let me just go back to the main model. There's 3D, let me go to 3D structural. Okay, the idea is we went through and placed on here a whole bunch of columns. Those are sort of sitting there at the bridge right now. I also went through and placed some beams. And for the beams, the big thing that we had to watch out for was just because this is a steel frame structure, we just had to watch out for the height of the beams. Because the height of the beams wants to be low enough so that it doesn't intersect with the floor, the pan of the floor. So that's why you'll see, in this case, I have it set to 4 and 8. It has to do with whatever the thickness is of my floor. If I choose the floor right here and see that it has a thickness of 4 and 8, I will match that and be 4 and 8 there in terms of the Z offset value. Now, this is a little bit different. If you remember last time, I was working with a model where the floor height was 5 inches. And that's OK if you have a 5-inch deck. Again, we just sort of need to keep those things in sync with each other. So have those beams hiding around under here. And this is pretty much where we started last time, where we sort of, or we're close to where we finished last time. I did go ahead and add a little bit more to it. I decided that all of these different columns that are poking on down there needed to have a little base support on them, since we didn't want all that concentrated load to hit right on the earth and kind of rupture of the earth right there. So we put some uh, concrete footings there just to distribute the load and make sure that uh, that load is spread out a little bit. So we can go ahead and take a look at that. If I go to structure and I choose, they have different types of footings here. They have isolated footings, which are good for point loads, wall footings, which are good for more structural wall loads, and slab footings if you have a big area load. So an area versus a line versus a point. If I choose that isolated, well, looks like I need to load one in here. I'll say, sure, let's load that. And what you're going to do is go to the folder that says structural foundations. You'll find there's all sorts of interesting foundations available in here. Oh, uh, footing rectangular is the one that we use most more commonly, but you'll find like a pile cap with piles. We have a lot of different variations on pile caps. If you want to, just load in a couple of those. There's not much harm in it. I'll just load in the whole bunch. So we can look at the variations. I'm going to say override them all. going to ask me about each and every one of those. <laughs> Enough with us here sharing. Nope. Just one more. Okay. Phew. So let's take a look at this. What we're going to do is, if we take these isolated foundations, we'll say structure, again, isolated footing, we can choose the type. I can choose the pile cap rectangular. Or I'm going to just go for the, with the foundation rectangular, footing rectangular right there. You'll see I have a couple different sizes there. I have 72 by 48 inches and 96 by 72. The area of that is really what's going to distribute it to the ground. So I'm just going to go for the smaller size now until I calculate that I need more. I'd like to place those. And if I place those, I can do that again in the floor plan view. But I often like to work in 3D. So what I'll do is I'll just say at columns and choose to put them at level one. And then it'll put it at the appropriate level, but just kind of cinch it right to the bottom of the column. The nice thing about doing that, actually, just so you get a sense of how that works, is that if the column moves, okay, that, that uh, foundation will move with it. So I'll put a couple in here, just so you get a sense of that. 
let me finish that up. The nice thing again about sort of working with it and saying, as opposed to just putting it in that XY location, but actually saying it's at the bottom of the column, is that if, for example, you change that column and you say, hey, that column doesn't start at level one, that column actually starts at level one minus eight feet or something like that. It actually moves it on down with it. So this is this whole notion of we try to create these structures where there's a hierarchy of relationships. Often at the top of the hierarchy is the notion that there's a grid, and then on the grid we place the columns, and then things hang from the columns. These piles or these foundation footings are at the bottom of the column, so if the column moves, it'll follow it. These beams are at the top of the columns, so again, if the column moves or the grid moves that the column is hanging on, they'll move. So you really try to have these parametrically flexible structures. And it saves you a lot of time if you kind of sort of model it that way in terms of being able to adapt quickly to changes. So I'll bring that back up to zero. Okay, so we have our structure. We have all of these uh, columns, we have these beams, we have these foundation elements, we're looking pretty good. The next step we probably think about is just the floor deck itself. Let's think about that. Because I've got this span between uh, the different beams that I have currently placed. And chances are the span's going to be a little bit greater than the floor deck itself can handle. Okay, so what I'll often do is put some smaller beams, some secondary beams in there between the major beams go through and really span the distance that the floor deck itself can span. Okay, so in this case, we'll see, oh, whatever that distance is, let's figure it out. Zoom on out. Looks like that currently is, but how much? I was looking for a dimension line. It's over on the other side. Looks like I'm looking at 22 feet in that direction. In the other direction, oh, it's probably like, well, let's see what's on the other direction. I guess that's about like 25, 26 feet, something like that. So if the span is too great for the steel deck for the lightweight concrete on top of it to hold, what I'm going to do is introduce some sort of secondary beams to kind of help that out. So in a wood frame structure, that's often, oh, we'll put secondary beams at every four feet or six feet because it's just based on the span that the wood deck can handle. Okay? In a concrete structure, often we can go through and space things out pretty far. If we have just columns at the corners, we need a very nicely reinforced deck so that it can span that entire distance okay, without any intermediate beams. Or even in concrete, we can put some intermediate beams in there, which means that then a lot of loads carried by the beams, the um, slab itself doesn't need as good as reinforcing. So it's really just what strategy you want to use. So if I was going to go through and put those in there, what I would like to do is basically put some beams in. Actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go up to level two, because on level two, I can actually see the beams. Actually, I could if they were wire-framed. Let's try that. <laughs> no, that's interesting. I'm going to go to this way. I'm going to go ceiling plan of level one. That'll almost always work. Again, I'm not seeing it. I'm sort of confused right now. I got my beams. I got my beams hanging around over here. They are currently at level two right there. So theoretically, if I am looking up in the ceiling plan, oh, it's probably just that I don't have the structural framing turned on. Let's go to level two again. See, visibility graphics. Structural framing looks like it's turned on. <coughs> We go through and take a look at the view range. They're just below. So that's what it is. Right now it's currently sitting at zero. If I make the ultimate view depth like a foot below, 
they should show up now. Nope. There they are. They're just kind of grayed out underneath there. Let me do it from the ceiling plan. It's probably a little bit easier to see over there. In the ceiling plan view, again, I'm going to visibility graphics and make sure I can see the structural framing. Looks like it's just turned off. That's why. But everything that could go wrong went wrong here. And then I'm going to turn it up to from a coarse view to a fine view. That'll basically give them thickness. In the coarse view, what happens is all those things are represented just as a single line. In the fine view, they're represented by the actual thickness. Let me turn off thin lines, and you'll sort of see, if I go back to coarse again, they're just showing up as heavy lines. OK, so in any case, I have these beams. They're kind of hanging around right now. And I want to go through and provide some intermediate supports. So here's what I want to do. I want to go through and put some beams that go between them. And I can do that. I can come over here and grab the beam tool and say I want to put that at level two. And I can go drag it on in here from this beam to this beam. And it'll do its best to go through and put a beam in there. Put another one in there. I'm going to put one over here. Now notice graphically, it is actually doing something that is appropriate. It's going through and it's kind of leaving what appears to be a gap. But graphically, that's the way we typically indicate it. Yeah. There's also, if you notice, sort of a hierarchy to the way the line weights are working right now. The heaviest beams at the outside of the main girders are kind of secondary beams. Okay. If you want to have some fun, try even putting some beams going across this way. Okay. That's more of a third level beam. Okay, so graphically it's trying to give you some sense of the hierarchy of the thing. But the truth is, if I had to draw all of these beams this way, it would really take a long time to go and get them all in there. So that's where the whole beam system thing comes in. So <coughs> Let me go ahead and rather than showing them all drawn individually, just work with a beam system. A beam system is really just a series of beams that all have some regular spacing to them. So like Carl, you and I were doing this, we get the beam system. We said that great, we're going to create a system. Let's go through and choose the size that will be included in that system. So we can choose whatever is available. Looks like I only have one size available now. If I loaded in some more, I could like uh, basically work with some other members. Maybe I'll load in a smaller member. So I'll go to structural framing, say uh, steel. I'll use some more wide flange sections. So as opposed to the 12 by 26, oh, I'm going to go for the oh, about a 10 by 19. I'll go for that. Bring that in as one of my members. It should be now available on that list. So I can choose that. Generally, what you do is you choose a distance. It can be a spacing, but often a fixed distance or a fixed number. Either one sort of works. Let's go ahead and I'm just going to do a fixed distance right now. Uh, oh, let's assume those are going to be either every six feet, every four feet, whatever you like. And what will happen is we have the choice of either sketching a beam system or putting an automatic beam system in. In a floor plan view, or in a ceiling plan view in this case, since we can see all the members there, there's kind of a nicely enclosed area, we can actually use the automatic beam system, which is very quick. If we choose it, and we just hover over the edges. You'll try to put those beams in there. Notice that depending on which edge we're hovering on, it sort of assumes that's the primary direction that the beams are going to span. So choose your direction. I'm going to run them in this direction. I can choose that direction there. Actually, before I go too far, let me go ahead and fix one other thing, though. You might remember that the beams were lowered by a little bit, so I actually want to lower these a little bit too. Say so four and an eighth. And I'll lower those too. Put some of these beam systems in. So beam systems actually make pretty short work of things. 
just uh, to kind of complete this, this beam system up front, you might remember I didn't sort of put the height elevation in it. So if I want to change that, what I can do is if I hover, I'm going to get one uh, beam. If I tab, I should be able to get the whole system. I'm going to try and get the whole system. It's like it's fighting with me. Hmm. Let me do it in 3D. These we think are running a little high. I tabbed and got the whole system. And now minus 0, 4, and 8. So you can do this in 2D or in 3D. Either way it works. Let's come back over here. Let's zoom on out. Now, in terms of doing these automatic beam systems, just a couple nuances to watch out for. Like, it'll work wherever there's a fully enclosed area. It won't work out here because there's not beams on four sides. So if I come in there, I come in here, I can sort of start adding those in. That's actually not too bad. If you at any time decide you want to change the directionality of the beams, that's quite easy to do too. As you go through and you draw those beam systems in, see if I can select it here. There we got that then. Okay. You can say edit it. And what happens is what it's going to indicate with uh, this little mark right there is which is the direction of the beam system. If you want to change the beam direction, you use the beam direction tool and just flip to the other side. And if you happen to have your joist running in the other direction and you decide to change it, you can switch it. You can go sideways instead. So it's easy to go through and change those after the fact. In fact, what's so nice about beam systems is it's easy to change everything about them. For example, if later on you decide that it really won't be every six feet, it's going to be every four feet, they swap right in there. Or even if you decide to change the structural member that you're using, if you decide that it wants to be something bigger or smaller or a thrust or something like that, you can change that and it just changes it for the whole system. So beam systems give you an awful lot of flexibility. Now, you can draw beam systems in 3D also. Let's go back to 3D and take a look at that. In 3D, though, you don't get to do the automatic beam system. Here, if you're going to do it in 3D, what you have to do is basically just select the edges. And what that looks like is, we'll say, beam system. That'll open up a new beam system. We say we want to pick some supports, so pick the supporting elements. And then the first one you pick is going to be the beam direction. And the other ones will then complete it. So you kind of fill it out that way. Now, beam systems are pretty good too in that they have all these boundaries and stuff like that. If it turns out that you need to change things because, oh, you have an elevator poking up or you have a stairway poking up and you can't actually have the beam system completely in that area, not to worry. What you got to do is basically just edit the boundary. Okay, now it's completely enclosed there. If I, for example, want to leave a hole because I have some sort of, again, a stairway or I have some sort of elevator or something like that, or even a hole in the floor because you know, I'm going to have some sort of an uh, atrium or something poking up, what you can do is just edit the boundary. Actually, maybe I'll do this. Uh, well, I could just edit the boundary. Let me do that. I'll just go say that the boundary is going to be here. I'm going to chop out the corner. The peak line rules apply, so I can trim this to that and trim that to that. Okay. And that's interesting. It didn't resize them for an but I sort of expected that to resize according to the rules. Hmm. Are they linked to the floor plates in some way? What's that? Are they linked to the floor plates in some way? They aren't. Well, actually, they are in the hierarchy. So if we had the floor plate, we could select the edges of the floor plate. That would actually work, which would be a good way to do it. 
Yeah, I'm surprised that didn't update, but yeah, basically as we start applying loads, it's going to be this whole hierarchy. We're going to apply loads to the floor plate. The floor plate's going to go through and transfer them to the beams. The beams are going to, or actually, floor plate's going to transfer it to the beam systems, because that's the first thing supporting it, and the beam systems are supported out to the major beams. And if you want to see that in action, let me show you how you can sort of see that. Go to the 3D structural model. You might notice that this 3D structural model, well, it's kind of showing uh, some basic structural elements kind of in the 3D sense, sort of spatially how they're related, but you don't see the analytical model. We can create a view that shows the analytical model or just turn it on here. Let me see if I can actually see it. It's this guy right here shows the analytical model. Actually, it did work. What you can sort of see now is those orange lines are actually representing the analytical lines. So when the slab is on top there, this is indicating the hierarchy is really how the loads will be collected and transferred back. Okay. So we're actually getting there in terms of what's going on. Let's go ahead and oh see if I can fix this again. If I want the floor to carry loads, and I'm going to turn on the notion of it being structural, so I'm going to turn on that checkbox that will allow it to carry loads. And as soon as I make that structural, you'll see even in the analytical model, it darkens. It kind of shows that that's actually a piece of the system right now. So. Let's just kind of change that, I think, kind of in line with what you're suggesting. Let's go through over here. I'm going to cut out sort of the corner of the floor as though something's happening back here. Again, whether that's a shaft or some stairway or something, I'm not sure. Now I'll go through and I'm going to redo that beam system. I'm just going to edit the beam system. Actually, what I'll do is I, it's funny, I wanted it, it, it placed it, but it didn't sort of resize it. So I'm just going to like go through and place it again because it was pretty easy to do. I'm just going to choose the beam system, see if I can get the beam system. It was right there. See, it understands the boundaries there, but it's not doing what it wanted to. So I'm just going to delete it. And I will recreate it. Picking that as the side, I'll pick that as a side. But here's what I'll do just to kind of complete it. I'll pick that edge right there and that edge right there and then do the pink line rules. intersecting, something's intersecting. I like it in the ceiling plan. Oh, it's up there. Yeah, it's looking pretty good. Except for the fact that some of you might notice that, oh, see any problems? problem on the floor edge over here where it's unsupported right now. So we need to go through and put some sort of beam in there. And you can mix and match beams and beam systems. If I do need to put a beam in there, what I'll do is I'll say that, oh, for example, here, right along there, there's a beam. And now it's going to pick up that edge. In that same funny sense, I probably will also need a beam just right on the edge of the floor right here. Go back to there. And now I got a good looking floor opening. Excellent. Okay, you have a, yes, Ms. Ruby. Uh, are the beams um, bolted or welded? It could be either. It, it does, it's, it's not presumed either way. In fact, if you go zipping on in there really close, you'll see it doesn't really show anything. 
So there's no bolted connection. There's not really a welded connection there. In fact, if you get real close, you, know, you might even notice they don't quite attach. Okay, analytically they're there, but here's what we gotta do. We gotta say a little about what the actual connection is. And then you can actually have put little families on them to indicate what the kind of true look is, whether it's a, some sort of a bolted series of angles and a haunch or something, or whether it's a welded connection. But what happens is, what we do is in both senses, let me kind of open the beam here. There's a start connection and an end connection. And you can sort of say really what it'll do, you know, whether it's going to carry some sort of moment or not. But this I don't think is as important as the setting we do if I select the analytical model. With the analytical model, which is the line right here, see if I can grab it. Okay, here you really have, it's the specific forces at the start and the end. Is it a pin connection? Is it a bending moment resisting connection or some combination thereof? So you can, for each of those, just sort of indicate in X, Y, Z, you know, what it resists and what it doesn't. And they'll transfer into E tabs or transfer into the structural analysis package. So you can figure out are they simply supported, just sort of, you know, you know pinned there in some way. Are they supported only from moving down? Are they supported from moving sideways to, or the actually transferring moments? So you get a lot of choices in there, but it's all done. So I'm indicating it in the model. But at least for the model, it doesn't mean really anything. Okay, it's kind of leaving that open-ended for you. Okay, now this is pretty good looking for this floor. I think that's kind of a okay. Let's go ahead and talk about what you want to do when you move on up, because here's the beauty of so many structures. Very often structures are the same, or very close to the same as you move up between level to level. You know, maybe if your structure has fewer or less floor area up above, it gets smaller. But for the most part, we tend to carry things down all the way to the foundation. So the beauty of kind of this kind of modeling is you can go through and just do a little grabbing of everything in the model. You can do some filtering to sort of filter out the parts you want. And I'm going to say I just want to get the columns. I want to get the beam systems, the girders, and the joists. I don't want to get the foundations, and I don't even want to get the analytical lines, because actually the analytical lines are going to come later. When we copy it, they'll be recreated for the new elements they put in place. So all the orange lines are there. So I'm just going to grab those guys, copy them. So copy them to the clipboard. And now we can paste them, align to a different level. This is one where I always have to try it twice to sort of get it right. I think I'm going to think of them as being on level three, going down to level two. Interesting, I didn't get the beam systems. Something about them being disassociated from the plane. I did get these. That's actually not too bad. Let me even here, I'll, for example, get rid of that little section because I don't necessarily want that up on the second floor. Let me try the beam system. Oh, that's interesting right there. Look at what happened back there. That's kind of really ugly. in terms of the new improved ones that are coming through. That doesn't look good at all. That has something to do with that opening I put in there and whether things uh, sort of were associated properly. Boy, that looks very bad. Okay, let's try this. Uh, I'm just gonna try some things one at a time. I'm gonna get that just beam system. Let me copy that and try pasting that up to level three. Okay, that actually worked. This one over here, again, I'll copy that and paste it up to level three. Do 
even I'll get this one over here. Try that again. Just copy it. Paste that to level three. This is the one I think had troubles last time. No, not too bad this time. Interesting. Didn't get the beams on the edges, but that's okay. Let's get those. Okay, so you basically start by kind of creating a model like this, and this overall, you know, it's not too awfully bad. I got some beam systems, I'm hopping into the other floors. It's looking pretty good. Yeah, I got the floor that's kind of looking good there. Um, we're in actually fairly good shape for what we want to be. There's a couple of things I want to think about, though, relative to the structure that we may want to change. For example, oh, right now this is all set up as though there's really a lot of beams and things like that that are supporting this level two roof, kind of a level three in there. I may not want that. I might actually want to go through and like a, have a big open clear span as opposed to something like this. So what I can do is actually think about, oh, as opposed to having the beams running down here at this level, I can go ahead and raise this up. Let me try attaching this up to the roof, and it did it. Okay. And now I can run a beam that's just going to run that entire link all the way on back. Let me do the same thing over here. I'm going to take that one over there. I'm going to attach that to the roof. So now what I can think about doing is, as opposed to having all these beams, which are down here, okay, instead, going through and having some beams that run the entire length, you know, to kind of create this big, soaring, clear story space. Let me get rid of that one right there. Creating big, soaring, clear story beams is not actually all that hard, especially if you have like a 3D snapping turned on, because I can snap from the base up here, vice versa. That'll sort of work. I can snap that in there, turn on 3D snapping. <laughs> thing over here. So that's not too awfully bad. It may turn out though as you're doing this that these beams would actually get to be quite deep and it wouldn't be good to do them with beams. You might want to do it with a truss element or something that's good for handling a longer span. And if you want to do something like that, not to worry. What we're going to do is sort of use the truss tool as opposed to the beam tool. We'll do the same sort of connecting. So if you're thinking about doing that with more of a truss, I could take that beam out and just say, let's use a truss instead. It says there are no truss families loaded, so let's go out and sort of see if we can find one. Now, there's a lot of truss shapes out here. You sort of need to have a truss shape that has approximately what you need. So if you have something that has two straight edges at the top and a bottom cord, that could be a nice one, this little pink truss. A cambered bottom cord, so kind of raised up in the middle a little bit. A how truss is just sort of flat on the top and bottom. Different sort of Pratt trusses, scissors trusses. And we can adapt the shapes to really be whatever we want. There's a nice little Warren truss. The nice thing about these shapes, though, is that they'll also adapt to different roof shapes. So for example, if I have a flat roof or a sloping roof, if you follow that, that'll be just fine. But even if you have like a curving roof or something that undulates, you can basically say, attach a truss to a roof, and it'll go through, and the cords will sort of follow exactly what's happening to the roof. So let's try this. Oh, I'll just try my little Warren truss. Actually, no, I'm going to go for the Pratt truss. Let's try putting this in here. No, I'm going to go back to the Warren one. I just can't decide. I'll choose that. Here's the way it's going to work. I'm going to basically just, again, try snapping here to there. See if that works just fine. 
not too awfully bad. Again, in this case, we have this issue of is it poking up or is it hanging below? In this case, I'm going to say let's go ahead and have the bearing cord be the top cord, not the bottom cord. That will drop it down. And then even here, it says top. What's it doing? It'll drop on down. I'm just going to drop on down. You, I think I was just changing the default as opposed to changing it for that one. Now, Ruby, you might notice here that we also have these kind of ambiguous connections because the truss cord elements don't look like they really join very well now. This could probably be all, it could be bolted, or it could be all welded, kind of called out there inside as like one big major element. What happens is, just for simplicity in terms of rendering it, as soon as Revit has two elements that sort of conflict with each other, it just stops drawing. It says, hey, I don't know what that connection is going to look like. You can give me some help. And we can change that in terms of kind of coping these all together and cutting it. As a good starting point, a great way to get going, though, is just to go through and just change to smaller elements. Part of the problem with this structure right now, at least in terms of these trusses, is that this only has this 12 by 26 to work with. That's pretty big. So if I change the cords to smaller, if I change them to 6 by 6s or 4 by 4s, it still it wouldn't be 100% accurate. It's accurate analytically, but it would look better than it does right now. And the way you do that is by loading in Oh, let me load in some structural framing here. I'm going to load in some steel. Again, if you're a wood structure, we could do this out of wood members too, just as easily. But I'll say, let's go ahead and get some hollow stoop steel. I'm going to load in some of the smaller members, like four by fours and six by sixes or something like that. I'll do the six. Eh. Where'd it go? Six by five, six by six. There's a six by six. So if I want to use those members on this, what I do is I edit its properties. And you can choose what the framing is. So if the diagonals want to be the 6 by 6s maybe the verticals want to be the 6 by 6s also. It'll do a better job of rendering the truss. You know, it's still not accurate in terms of it still has those gaps in there where it'll be welded. But it'll do a little bit better than that. Now, the trusses really are cool in that they can go ahead and deform themselves if necessary and give a rounded surface or something like that, such as a barrel vault or something. And Shalema, that might be useful for you for that surface over the middle of the area. You can start with sort of squarish trusses, but that's just going to give you a sense of what that looks like. For example, I'm going to go through, and here's the big flat roof that I've drawn so far. I'm going to go through and create a nether roof that's a little, uh, oh, just kind of funkier. I'll say I do it by extrusion. Where am I? I think it's on grid D. We'll see if that works. OK, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a roof that is just more of an arky shape. Push that down a little further. Okay, super. That's my new improved roof. If I want to go through and have that truss attached to that roof, I can just say attach it. And cross your fingers. It cannot attach to that. The truss is not project or the object. Okay, invalid profile. Let's try this again. The 
question is whether, why it failed, and did it fail because this doesn't stick out far enough? Or did it fail because the geometry doesn't work for that kind of truss? I'm going to pull it out a little bit further and try again. Attach it. Let us see. Looks like it's working harder this time, so maybe it's getting further. It's trying to regenerate something. big old rounded truss, which is you know, not too bad in the scheme of things. <laughs> okay, so that can save you some time in terms of putting that all together. So that's actually looking pretty good in terms of what's going on. I'm going to show you one more thing about the sloping roof, though, that's just kind of an interesting one. There's this whole issue of really if you have a beam system and you have a sloping roof, how do you get a beam system on a slope? Because you can see that beam systems generally are on nice flat planes, and that works very, very well. But if, for example, I want to think about there being some beams that connect these two different trusses, I might want to put a beam system in there. So here's the deal. I got this beam system, or I got this truss over here. If I want to, I can kind of make another truss over here just like it. In fact, if I just take this out. And I choose that and I say I want to copy it. I'm going to copy it from this point here. Let me do it in a floor in a like a floor plan view. It'll be a little bit easier. That's basically the truss. Let me copy that over here. I'm going to copy it right from the center point of that over to the center point here, just so I get a nice precise alignment, just so I don't mess up. OK, so here's the deal. I got these fabulous beams down here in this beam system. They're looking good. I'd like to do something like that up here and create some like roof rafters or some purlin, something to go through and support that. And that sounds like that could be some trouble, but just kind of a quick way to make that happen that's actually really nice. What you can do is all of these beams, when we put them in the beam system, are actually associated with a reference plane. Okay? And the reference plane is typically level one or level two. So every time you create one, you tell it what plane you want to put them on. The cool thing is planes don't have to be vertical or horizontal, they could be tilting too. We just need to create a plane that's for our tilting, and then the beams will place on that plane instead. So this is like if you're going to do rafters and a wood frame structure. This is how you would do it. You basically choose a plane that follows the roof, and then apply the beams in that plane. So how that looks is a little as follows. Let me go to, I'll just do it on the east side. What I'm going to do is create for myself a plane Reference planes are right over here. I'll choose a reference plane. And I'm going to pick a surface for the reference plane. And the surface I'm going to pick is actually the underside of the roof. That means that when I place the beams, they'll support the underside of the roof. So I can click right there to place that plane. Now, that plane is there. You can sort of see it's these slightly dashed green lines. It's a little hard to see. I'll tab to get it. It's right there. But if I want to use it, I'm going to give it a name because that'll make it easy to identify. I'll say it's going to be my sloping roof bottom. Okay. And by doing that, what I'm going to be able to do is now go through and place things along that plane. So here's how the beam system works again. You might remember. It says, oh, beam system. Let me find it over here. We are going to go through and pick some elements. 
but we're also going to go through and choose, oh, well, actually I can't do it right now. Work plane is still set to level two. So I'm gonna fix that before I get in there. I'm gonna say set the work plane to the sloping roof bottom. So again, let me pause then do that again. What I'm gonna do is before I open the beam system, say set the work plane to the sloping roof bottom. And then when I create the beam system, it'll be set to sloping roof plane and I can go through and put these on there on that plane. So now I can say, great, my first element's here. Hmm. I actually don't have a fourth element over there, so I'm just going to draw it as a line. And when I finish that up, you'll see I got a whole bunch of beams that are crossing <coughs> over between the different truss elements. So I'm going to pause there on the structural modeling right now because there's a lot of other stuff. I think a lot of it will make more sense as you try to apply it to your own structure and really try to make it work. But at a high level, just this whole load notion of beams, columns, beam systems, copying them up, trusses when you need them, that works pretty well. Oh, other line random things. If, for example, you have concrete walls or structural walls that can actually carry loads, we don't need to be using these columns. We could actually have a concrete wall there and carry the loads on that. That would be just fine. But again, we'll pause and kind of return to that. We'll look at some more structural stuff later. Let's do this. Let's take a break now. And when you come on back in five, we're going to shift gears around a little bit. We're going to talk about A360 and BIM360 and how all your models live there and be sharing them there. So, you know, we won't push much further on structure today. But uh, we'll shift to sort of more model coordination and integration. Okay? So come on back in five. <laughs>